Today is August 13, 2018. Um, this is the oral history video project um, from the Russell H. Morgan Department of Radiology and Radiological Science. The main purpose of this video project is to record a conversation of uh, uh, radiologists and researchers who have contributed significantly to the department and also to have an opportunity to have a conversation about their memories of the and information about the field they have served for so long. The second purpose is to uh, host this recording on a website for public per use. And finally, the other purpose is to archive the interest in these interviews, basically to archive the, hist the interviews for historical recording for the Department of Radiology. My name is Mahadeva Mahesh. I am the professor of radiology and chief physicist for the Department of uh, Radiology. And it is uh, with pleasure I have here uh, with me Dr. Stanley Siegelman, uh, professor of radiology um, who has spent a considerable amount of time in the department and um, we are going to have a conversation uh, with Dr. Siegelman. Dr. Siegelman, thank you. Um, it is my pleasure to have a chance to talk to you. So, let us start off with basically telling how did you get started in the whole field of radiology? Um, how did you get into the field of radiology? Okay. Well, <clears throat> I came from a lower middle class family and not wanting to go into debt. Uh, after graduating from Cornell and being in medical school, I entered the army in my fourth year of medical school and was paid as a first lieutenant in the army. At that time, physicians were required to spend two years of military service. So for entering the army, I acquired another year of obligation. So I had three years. So after graduating from medical school, I wasn't certain what field I wanted to go into. I was favoring internal medicine. So uh, I interned at Walter Reed. Mm -hmm. That was a highly selective choice by the Army. We had 31 interns from 31 different medical schools, but we were all AOA. At the end of that year, uh, many of the interns chose to take Army residencies. The rest of us, people came up from Washington and said, what would you like to do? You are the cream of our crop. And they said, we offer you an opportunity to get on the job training in radiology, and then you can spend the rest of your time in the military as a radiologist. I wasn't interested in radiology at that time, and I said no. I said, please, I don't want to be a general medical officer. Please send me someplace where I could be an internist. Yeah. So I was sent to the Fort Meade Army Hospital where I ended up spending three years mm -hmm. on the medical service, functioning as an internist, working with other trained internists. And my thoughts at that time were to go into internal medicine or some subspecialty of internal medicine. In my second year there, the head of radiology was a military radiologist who was spending his last year before retirement. And I was very unimpressed with him and what he offered. But the next year, we had a young radiologist who had had two years of residency in Philadelphia. And he was very inspiring. And I saw how radiologists could be very helpful. Sure. And at that time, I was a little dismayed with internal medicine because there was so much to know. And I thought, if one were to be a specialist, you should know, be able to learn everything. And I thought radiology was a field that I could learn everything. So I decided to go into radiology at that time in my third year at Fort Meade Army Hospital. Interesting. So before you went to, where did you go to medical school? You tell Cornell? Okay, well, I grew up in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. attended Cornell University, and then went to the Downstate Medical School, State University of New York at Downstate. Sure. So, you, how many siblings you had? And uh, so, you grew up in Brooklyn. So, around in uh, what time period? And well, it was the nineteen. It was late thirties, forties, fifties, and uh, a very good time in Brooklyn. I had a lot of friends and. Uh, 
it was a good place to grow up. Yes. Were you from a large family or a small family? Well, <coughs> I have one brother, one younger brother. And uh, so we both went to the same high school. I was valedictorian and went to Cornell. But he was president of the high school and went to Harvard. <laughs> and um, he also became a physician. And interestingly, in his later years, he retired as a physician and became a stockbroker. Mm, interesting. So were your parents also in the field of medicine? No. My parents were not college graduates. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother was a housewife who had taken a commercial course in high school. And my father worked for his uncles at a business where he w they were. They had a transportation business. In his later years, he became an automobile driving instructor. Interesting. So what, who pushed you to college? And was your parents very much uh, a force behind the scene? Yes. Well, I, I knew I was going to college. When I went to Cornell, I w went as a math major, mm -hmm. thinking I would become a teacher. But in my first year there, I took some aptitude tests. And I came out ranked lowest as mathematician. And there were two things that had the highest rating. One was YMCA director. <laughs> okay. And the second was physician. Okay. So I decided to become a pre-med at that point, my okay. first year in college. Okay. But you still continued to be a teacher in the long right, time. Right. But I still, my first goal was to be a teacher. And I always loved teaching. And I was fortunate to get into a field in radiology where I could do a lot of teaching. So when you, uh, so finally when you decide to go into radiology, so you started at the Fort Meade Hospital? No, no, I, I, I became a first year resident at Montefiore Hospital. In New York? In, in the Bronx. Bronx. So, so I was an AOA, Years of experience, so I, I think I was the ideal candidate for radiology for, for radiology residency. But I went to several places where uh, I met people who told me, "Don't come here. This isn't very good." But when I got to Montefiore, everyone was very excited about the program and spoke highly of it. So uh, that's that's what made me choose that, and I, without any regrets. So when you mentioned AOA, what is AOA? That's an honor society in medical school for people who are in the top 10% of the class. It's a medical fraternity. Well, it's an honor society, honor society in medical yes. school. Right. So when you were in um, uh, Montefiore, like that's when around like 1970 or 60s? Well, <clears throat> that was 1961. Yeah, okay. So, so what was the main, like was radiology, was even a department or was it merged like along with, uh, was that? Well, <clears throat> when I, I took training and got boards in radiology, which included, the, the program included two years of diagnostic radiology and one year of radiation therapy. Because the radiation I was actually therapy. the chief resident in radiation therapy because okay. I had my experience in uh, clinical medicine. They made me chief resident. So radiation therapy was not as separated as part of radiology? Well, but... The training was as part of radiology training, but pa people, physicians who practice radiation therapy practice that as a separate. As, as a separate. So over the years, everyone signing up for that program mm -hmm. was inter in di interested in diagnostic radiology. But there was a very charismatic director of radiation therapy, Dr. Charles Botstein, mm -hmm. and about 10 people over the years went, actually went into radiation therapy from that program. From that program. So when you, uh, when you started radiology, what was the imaging status at that time? I know. Well, it was mainly mm -hmm. plain films and uh, GI series, IVPs, angiograms. Angiograms were new at that time, mm -hmm. but we, we were doing angiograms. We were just starting with nuclear medicine. That, okay. was, that was very new. And we didn't, really, we didn't have ultrasound or CT yeah. or MRI. Also new was mammography mm -hmm. and orthograms. Yes. So actually, 
in, I spent 12 years at Montefiore. Yes. Three years as a resident, nine years on faculty. faculty. But it was a very small department. And I think I was one of the very last general radiologists okay. with experience in every field. So mammography wasn't going well, and as chief resident, my chairman, uh, Harold Jacobson, called me and said, I want you to supervise mammography. And for a year, I supervised every case, read every case, did follow-ups on it, wrote several papers on mammography. Sure. But Dr. Jacobson was interested in musculoskeletal radiology, and I worked with him on that. And uh, Dr. Bosniak came to our department. He had just come from Cornell with a fellowship in cardiovascular radiology, mm -hmm. so I got very interested in angiography. So I thought my two main fields were angiography and musculoskeletal. But then one of the physicians, a chest physician, wanted to write a book and asked Dr. Jacobson for a recommendation to some young radiologist to help him with the book, so he picked me. So I was also came in chest radiology. I also wrote many papers on georadiology, GI radiology, so I had qualifications in every area of radiology. It's something I didn't want to give up. Sure, and that's very unusual these days too. So you became unusual yeah. because there's so much to know about every area. Exactly, but still what we see now is still in some of the private practice, they would prefer a general radiologist over a very specialized radiologist. Am I correct? Right, people like to get people with training and, and a fellowship so that they can focus on one, one area of radiology. See, this was the thing, when I was in medical school, mm -hmm. it was already started, none of my classmates wanted to go into general practice or family medicine, because there was so much to learn, sure. too much to know. <laughs> so more and more that, as the knowledge has expanded, the need to, f to focus Become. has increased, and sure. that's what we have today. Understand. So you thought radiology was small, and then when you came, it started expanding really big. Yeah. So I went to my, the, my 50th anniversary of graduation from medical school. Okay. When I came, some of my classmates came up to me and said, how did you know <laughs> to go into radiology? Yeah. It's such a great field. But how did you know? Yeah. It was nothing back then. Yes. But I was, I was fortunate. It's true that there wasn't that much to it. It was more the art of radiology. Because okay. you yes. didn't really look directly at the abnormality. You saw secondary effects on the barium, secondary effects on the IVP. So it, was, it, was, it took a lot of skill. Skill. And, 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 yes. and um, what made you, what brought you to Hopkins? Okay. Well, this is a story I've told before, but mm -hmm. let me tell this story sure. in full. So those of you who saw the movie The Graduate. Yes. So... A college graduate comes to a party being given by his parents, and one of the guests calls him aside, and he says to him, I want to whisper one word to you, plastics. Okay. Well, at that time, that was possibly true, but yeah. if that movie were being remade today, the word would be networking, networking. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so I, got, I came to Hopkins because, I, I believe, because of networking. So. My chairman, Harold Jacobson, was a wonderful chairman, but he had one rule. He said, I have the interest of all my people at heart. So if I ask you to do something, you can't say no. Okay. So he asked me to be on a committee of the American College of Radiology mm -hmm. that was developing a code <coughs> classification. Sure. Because every radiology department had a teaching museum and they wanted to classify the cases by anatomy, by the, the place they are in the body. Yeah. So we need a classification of 70s or GI, a GI and 40s or musculoskeletal. Sure. And after the decimal point, whether it's inflammatory or congenital or neoplastic, and see, it it's was like a taxonomy of the a whole taxonomy. thing. Taxonomy, and it's kind of a boring thing. But so I was on that. I, I couldn't say no. I was on that committee. And we met several times for several days at a time. And on that committee was John Dorst from Johns Hopkins yes. and Bob Heitzman from Syracuse, Dr. Jacobson, and myself. Okay. And we developed that coding. And we got to know each other quite well and got along. So when a position for director of diagnostic radiology at Johns Hopkins came up, John Dorst knew me, yeah. and he put my name forward. Interesting. So he, I, he must have spoke highly of me because 
I got the job. I also had spent three years in Maryland yes. at Fort Meade. At Fort Meade, so I knew I liked Maryland, so that's how I, I came to Maryland. So which year did you join Hopkins? So I joined Hopkins in the summer of 1973, so that's 45 years ago. 45 years ago, and that's the year before the CD was developed. Well, mm -hmm. it it was five years, f six, five or six years before we got a CT at of John's the body, Hopkins. C body CT. Right. Yeah. So that so over the past four years, so four decades, you have seen a lot of things happen in radiology here. Right. So, what are your fondest memories of? Well, mm -hmm. first, let me say, I can sort of divide the main part of my life into five twelve-year periods. Sure. Twelve years. I went to school and high school. Mm -hmm. The next 12 years, I went to college, medical school, and the Army. Yeah. The next 12 years, I spent at Montefiore Hospital as a resident and faculty member. The next 12 years, I spent as Director of Diagnostic Radiology at Hopkins and Head of CT. Okay. The next 12 years, I spent as Editor of Radiology. Yes. I seem to have had triskaidekaphobia. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't want to do it, spend a 13th year doing anything. So, interesting. So when you came here as the di uh, d director of diagnostic radiology, um, what different, uh, so what are the different main things where you guys were doing here at that time clinically? Clinically what you were doing, like a lot of the fluorosity? So clinically I want to strengthen the department mm -hmm. and what part of my expertise was in cardiovascular radiology. But we had a very strong department in cardiovascular radiology with Bob White and Don Harrington. Yes. So I decided n not to do that. I decided to emphasize teaching, teaching the medical students, sure. teaching the residents, and doing uh, reading general radiology, musculoskeletal, chest. And, uh, but I spent a lot of effort on teaching medical students and also recruiting. Yes. I thought. Johns Hopkins is a very fine place. We should, we should be able to get excellent residents. And for 35 years, I was in charge of residency selection. So, but during those 35 years, you also served as the editor of radiology. I was editor of radiology. But how are you managing both of them? Because this is a very intensive one. Well, true, but my philosophy mm -hmm. as the program director Yes was to put all the emphasis into getting the very best people. Okay. Because I think at Hopkins with a wonderful department of medicine and surgery and pathology and ENT and all these wonderful departments and very good equipment, you didn't have to spend a lot of effort uh, monitoring the residents. You just turn, if they were really good, you just turned them loose. Yes. So. I didn't have a lot of hands-on, day-to-day nitpicking about the sure. residency. I just, I figured if we got the best, we were getting the best people in the country interested in radiology, and we're just sort of turning them loose. They didn't need a lot of supervision. We supervised them to some extent, but it didn't take 20 hours a week to, to monitor the program. Most of my time when I was an editor was working on the journal. It was actually an 80% job. but. My 20% I didn't spend as one day a week. I would come over every day for a few hours. Understand. But um, so when you are also editor, how did you maintain your uh, clinical certification and equity and all those things? Because well, I was I was uh, going to conferences, giving lectures. I wasn't reading films, but I I somehow maintained my competence. Understand. But you, but you're also learning a lot when you're doing editing. Right. And mm -hmm. a lot of my conferences I would give based on articles we had just accepted for radiology before they were published, would tell the residents about them. I understand. So, so you, you were here when like the CT came. So you, I know you as a director, you were involved heavily with the body CT. So how did you see that technology change the whole? Well, when, when, I, when I first observed the effects of CT, it was like a eureka moment. I saw that. That's CT was going to be the way to trump other imaging studies. CT, the chest was so much better than a chest x-ray. CT, the abdomen had so much better than a GI series IVP. I saw that CT was going to emerge and the other areas of diagnostic imaging would recede a bit. 
And I gave everyone in the department an opportunity. So I asked the cardiovascular radiologist, give them one day a week, the GU radiologist, give them one day a week on CT. Sure. Wanted everyone to, to, come, to learn CT. And that field has expanded like, um, so I just was um, recalling this, uh, the fact about CT. Um, in 2006, I was involved with the national report. There are 62 million CT procedures done in the US. And now we are regrouping to rewrite the report. It's 2016 data is 82 million CT procedures. Unbelievable. Over a decade of four decades, it has increased so much. Well, also the quality of the images has improved. Yes. And uh, I know you were, when you were starting off, you were trained like you were looking at one or two images, a radiograph, one radiograph or two radiograph. When the CT came, you were bombarded with images. So how did you guys balance it out? Well, <clears throat> when CT, <laughs> first started in the first few years, an exam would consist of 16 images. We didn't get consecutive three millimeter slices. Okay. We got 10 millimeter slices. And sometimes we would get it not consecutive, yes. but every other one. Oh. And we would put in a plate that, that would give us four images. Yes. And we would hand carry that plate to be developed. And generally an exam would consist of four plates, four, four sets images, of four yes. by four. So it wasn't that many images to look at. It was a lot more than we looked at before, but it wasn't that many. But as the years went by, the number of images kept increasing. Okay. Yes, I, and also like your mind frame, because you are looking at plain radiograph. You were trained to look at the plain radiograph with all the superimposition. Now come the CT. So how, how challenging was it to train, like, you know, going from plain to axials, well, there was no place anyone could go for a fellowship, really. So I was self-trained in, in CT. But what we would do, we would have a regular conference with ultrasound. Ultrasound, okay. Roger Saunders in ultrasound was used to looking at cross-sectional images. Yes. So we'd have joint conferences, and uh, that, that helped a bit. Interesting. But it was a question of learning the anatomy. Yes. And... When you look at an, looking at an image of a CT, it was either normal, yes. or something was enlarged, or something was missing, or fourthly and most important, something was there that didn't belong. And you had to pick that up and describe it. It's amazing, yes. So you, are, you have published a lot of paper, more than 350 papers or something. So what made you interested in the research area from the beginning, doing research? Well. I was always, I always had an academic bent and uh, even when I was in the army I was giving, we, we'd have regular conferences, I would give lectures and uh, I liked reading about things and I guess whenever I would find an interesting case, something I hadn't seen before, I would read up on it okay. and try to impress that in my memory. This is something I learned and when I, when I would learn something that I thought was not of general knowledge, I thought, well, I'd publish about it. And so you are basically like uh, chartering the way for some of the early images you're trying to publish as much as possible. Right. And so, um, so I know the, 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 the art of publication has changed over the years. Um, how, was, how challenging was it when you started as the editor in radiology? Well, when I was at Montefiore, yes. I had, I had published about 100 papers before I came to Hopkins. I came as a full professor, but I thought sometimes my best work, very innovative, uh, I would send to AJR. Yes. They would send it back to me without reviewing. Montefiore Hospital, who wants a paper from Montefiore Hospital? Turned down by radiology, some of my best papers. so. I had a paper published in a Canadian journal that I thought was outstanding. <laughs> I had a paper published in an obscure surgery journal. And I said, something is, you know, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not satisfied with this radiology. Once I sent a paper to radiology, 14 months later, I, I, I finally got the answer on them. So as editor of radiology, I said, I want to make things better for the authors. Sure. Better for the readers, have more practical things, and better for the reviewers. For the reviewers, I started this thing about Editor's Recognition Awards, Yes. and I said that if I had a reviewer who won awards for me, I would write a letter recommending their promotion, okay. and I would say that reviewing is an important part sure. 
of the scientific venture and someone who has excellence in review it should be considered as a factor in their promotion. Because that contributes a lot because we struggle getting review, reviewers to accept the task for reviewing. Yeah. Um, but, but you know, we, you, you mentioned that you had these challenges with other journals not accepting. Was it not a, like a blinded application or was it like a peer review when they sent it? Wasn't, it was not blinded. Okay. We, we started blinding at, at, uh, at radiology. Because that makes a lot of difference in the blinded versus well, non-blinded. Well, there was some research that showed that that's true. Okay. Because you always had the implicit bias to cancel off the whole thing. On the other hand, when I came to Hopkins, yes. every time I sent it a paper, it would be accepted. Yes. So I, it went from one extreme to the other. And in the heydays of CT for about a five-year period, we were uh, publishing one paper every three weeks. Wow. And for three consecutive years, we had at least one paper in the Journal of Computer-Assisted Tomography. Over that three-year period, we had like 50 papers. 50 papers. That's a lot of And content. they would accept my, they, whenever I sent a paper, they would accept it. I've never, I never had a paper rejected from that journal, so. But, but I think they were good papers. That, no, no, they were good paper yeah. otherwise. Yeah. Understand. Um, but the other thing is like, I know um, radiology journal was like, it, the headquarters is in Chicago, but you did everything from here. Well, once a month I f would fly out to Chicago. Oak Brook, Chicago. I would go make a trip to Chicago and meet with the copy editors and the people in the journal and go make policy and go over things. And but you did all the reviews and uh, accept final acceptance decision all here? I had an office in the 550 Understood. building. Yes. And you had some staff to work with? Donna you? Maggot was very helpful. She was an uh, associate editor. She handled many of the musculoskeletal papers. Oh, okay. So Donna And Maggott. I called on various members of the faculty to as reviewers. So I had no problem getting reviewers because I recognized the reviewers, I rewarded the reviewers. So when you, at the same time, you also took upon um, uh, the residency education. You were the, the program director. So yes. how did you go about, what were your key ideas? Like pick up the best candidates. How did you, what, what made you pick well, them? Well, we would get 400 to 500 applications. Uh, I would go through all, I went through every app, would go through every application and pick out the top 90, let's say, and offer them interviews. And then we would make up a list of our preferred, and invariably we would get from the top 20, sometimes the top 10 candidates. So I felt like, with the analogy to the National Football League, Yes. You want to improve your team, but you, only, you get one first-round draft choice. Sure. I felt that we were getting three or four first-round draft choices every year. Wow. People that other institutions probably had as number one. I remember a number of times, like when we recruited Dave Blumke, yes. I got letters from other places. How did you get that guy? Really, what we really wanted, he was an MD, PhD. Yes. Uh, with Norm Beauchamp, I got a letter about him, he was that he was the, you've got to take him, he was the best I ever saw, yeah. and things like that. And every year, f for, for a significant period, we were getting, I think, the cream of the crop of people. Yeah. I would think we probably did better than any other program in, in getting people, and that's because we, our residents were happy. Yes. There wasn't a lot of requirements. We, we didn't have, we didn't bother them with things. They were here to learn and we turned them loose. Understand. So let me ask you another question in the sense like I know you were, you were getting all the top candidates from the top schools. So on a paper, they all look pretty much the same in you. But among them, how would you pick which one? Was it like how they interacted in the interviews? Well, the interview was, was important. Okay. And one of the things I did was to make, we had a committee to evaluate them and half the committee was residents. Okay. So I know at other places I would hear stories, someone would come and the faculty would come sure. to interview them, yeah. and the faculty would pick up their application and start reading because he or she never saw it before. Okay. But with our residents, they would study yes. the things carefully, and so when the residents would ask a question, they'd say, hey, this guy, he, he or she, he, he re they really read my application. And I think that was very important. And also, there were subtle things 
that came through that I, I think the committee did a very good job of picking people. So naturally, we like people who were AOA yeah. and scored very high yeah. on, on the uh, MCATs. Sure. Because there is a correlation between mm -hmm. how you do on the MCATs and how you do on other examinations. So that was important. But then we looked for other clues. Some people were very passionate about the fact that they wanted to go into academic radiology and be a professor. Some people were uh, offspring of professors. That always impressed me. If someone, if they're a woman whose father was a professor, I, I, I lean toward them. I'm very proud of the fact that our committee picked three people who did not have good records and yet are now chairman of radiology. Uh, so it was, it's the art of pick, picking the right yeah, person. It's like art of radiology, you know, the art right, of picking. Right. And that's the way. So among all these residents through the years you have seen, I know you already named a couple. So can you name and talk about them a little bit? Well, you have, I, yeah. oh, go ahead. I'm hesitant to do this because yeah, I, I might leave off someone important. Understand. So, but. I, I don't want to put you on the spot of uh, whom you're picking, but... I have a list here. I have 20 people uh -huh. who were residents yeah. and then became faculty. Yes. So Bill Scott, Donna yes. Maggot, Jean Fritz and Musculoskeletal, Karen Horton, Linda Chu, Satomi Kawamoto. So Karen, Karen Horton is our current chair. Current chair. Pam Johnson, Janet Kuhlman, who were yes. in body imaging. Yes. Elias Sahuni and David Blumke in MRI, Ulrika Hampa in ultrasound, Najee Khoury, Dave Fagan, John Eng, Dave Usum and Ari Blitz in neuroradiology, Cliff Weiss, Chris Georgiatis, and Bud Liddell in cardiovascular, plus uh, people who did notably well at other places, Scott Traratola, Mike Sulin and Suarell at Penn, Michael Adelaide and David Grand at Brown, uh, Rusty Hoffman, who's at Stanford, is doing a wonderful job. David Nadish, who is an outstanding chest radiologist at NYU. Eric Tam, who's at MD Anderson. And there are many others, but yes. there was a 10-year period where 50% uh -huh. of the residents went into academic radiology. And, that, um, and, and that's a dream of an ac any academic program. That's a dream of an academic program. Yes. Now, it's hard to judge because every single candidate Yes who comes through and we said, what are your plans? They all say, well, I'm interested in academic yes. radiology, whether they were or not, whether they were really interested or not, they all said they were because they expected, a, they expected that that's, just, that's what Johns Hopkins wanted. That's true. So I know because I have worked quite a, with quite a few of them in the list which you gave me, and uh, they're all doing very well in the field. And if many of them I had talked about, and all of them recall very fondly of the interaction they had with you. And they were really pleased that they had a chance to learn under your tutelage. So I know Dave Blumke is right now has taken the chair, uh, the editor of the radiology. Right. So when the radiology, when you were like editing the whole, like the scientific world was developing, well, did you see a pattern of uh, research coming from one particular part of the geographic part of the world or how is it changing? Well, we, we had extensive use of computers in in our radiology office and would, uh, would issue various reports. And one trend that I noticed yeah. was that more and more submissions were coming from outside the United States. Yes. From Europe and Asia, particularly from Europe. And having this in mind, mm -hmm. I took some of the best people who were submitting papers that were being accepted and put them on the editorial board. Okay. And that that gave them great status sure. in their country, but, and I th had editorial indicating this and saying, you know, radiology was r becoming a truly international journal. Yes. yes. And that trend has continued more and more, a higher and higher percentage of papers come from other countries. And that's true with RSNA also because uh, there's a significant number of people coming outside the U.S. attending the meeting. And right. RSNA has become more like a global meeting and radiology. Well, it has thing. been that way for many years. Many right. years. Um, so, w w and the other thing which is like as an editor, would you also very much uh, strict on the time frame of the reviews and other things? Right. Well, that was under my program that I said I was going to be better for authors. Okay. I said that 
if you send a manuscript to radiology, you will get an answer within nine weeks. Okay. I later switched it to eight weeks. Sure. So we sent every manuscript to three reviewers. Now, if two reviews came back and they were highly laudatory, I would just accept that paper and not wait for the third one. Sure. If two reviews came back and it was borderline, I would have my people call up that third review and say, hey, please get that in as promptly as you can. And occasionally, it would be eight weeks, and I had two, only two reviews back, and it wasn't clear. So I would go over the paper and make up my, my sure. own mind whether it should be accepted. So I, for many years, I honored that rule, and no author had to wait for more than eight weeks to get an answer. And that, I think but that's important to that's the author. That's a yeah, very key point to know, that, to get the authors back to the journal. So the other aspect is like um, uh, when you're editor also, um, how were you able to like select the reviewers? Like you were inviting people to become reviewers or how is that? Well, I was notified by Dr. Heitzman who was in charge of, p for the RSNA, picking the editor. I was notified that I would be the editor. Okay. And uh, there would be uh, a six month period bef before sure. I took over. So. During that time, I went around visiting various academic institutions, about 10 of them. I wrote to the chairman saying, I would like to be invited because I sure. want to recruit reviewers. And I would give a talk and tell people how, if you're a reviewer, uh, you'll get recognized by Editor's Recognition Award. You'll, I'll help you get promoted. I think it's an important ac activity those of you who would like to volunteer to be reviewers, please, you know, sign up. And then I would send a questionnaire to the reviewers, and they would indicate to me what they would be willing sure. to review. So if they were a G reviewer, they would view ultrasound and CT, but not MRI. Sure. If they were mainly MRI reviewer, they wouldn't review pediatric. I had a profile in every review. And then when the reviews came back, uh, the reviewers would rank the papers from one to nine. One being definitely published, two very good you should publish, nine don't publish, three very good if you have room publish it, but not all the threes got published. But I would also rate the review. Yes. So one, t one to nine. Some reviewers only casually wrote half a paragraph, they no. get a six. Yeah. Some reviewers would there were 12 references. They Xeroxed every reference and read them and said reference five really shouldn't have been cited. Sure. And very careful, they'd get a one or two. Sure. And so I would know, one of the things I did was I sent out the manuscripts. Okay. Other editors assigned other people to yes. do it. But I thought that was very important. Who do you send the manuscripts to? So I would have a listing of the reviewers and what they what they rating now, if I if you send me a paper and I sent it to two reviewers whose ratings were eight and six, your paper would be rejected because yeah. they tend to reject every paper. Exactly. Why do I keep them as reviewers? Well, they were very critical. They pointed out every possible every little thing wrong, yeah. but they're too critical. Sure. So I actually wrote a paper on this calling "Assassins and Zealots." Okay. There were some people who were zealots. Their average score was two. In other words, they loved every paper. I tr if I try, to, I try to find out, how come you do this? They say, well, we want to see more ENT papers in the journal, so sure. we like to upgrade yeah, our sure. papers. And there are, there are other people who are assassins. Their, their <laughs> average score was eight or nine. Now, but I would compare their score to the scores of the other two reviewers, because yeah. every manuscript, sure. and they were significantly worse. Okay. So I never could find out. Um, in detail, why all the assassins were assassins. Some I found out, they said, well, if my paper wasn't good enough to get into radiology, <laughs> this paper certainly isn't good enough. So okay. you have to watch out. Sure. If people send you papers and they get rejected, don't use them as reviewers. As main reviewer because that but, can So be, the yeah, best right. reviewers I could pick, if some young person mm -hmm. had two papers accepted for radiology, that would make a great review because they the, were the, yeah. up on that subject sure. and they were eager and th those, that's, that's how I would get, get my best new reviewers. Many of them would not be in the United States. Understand. So the other thing which I see now, 
I'm, I'm currently serving as editor, associate editor for a journal of the American College of Radiology, JACR. We are doing the same thing, like to find the niche editors. And sometimes it's very tough, you know, no, even among the physics people, to go like three, four, fifth people, they would hardly accept it. Coming back to the question, like before you took upon the role of editor, what, what did you had experiences on the editorial board of other journals, or? I was a review reviewed for many journals, and we're on a, it was on a few editorial boards, like radiographics, right? So you just wa you wanted to take up this chance to clean up this whole process. Well, you know, there's often uh, a syndrome scene. So someone is abused as a child, sure. and then they abuse their children, <laughs> and I felt. I'm going to reverse that. I was abused as a young academician, but I'm not going to. I'm going to sure. help other people. Sure. And in addition, in every issue, I had at least one state-of-the-art paper. Yes. And editorial. Beautiful. And I told my reviewers, if you're a good reviewer, you're going to get called on to write a state-of-the-art article or to write an editorial. That's, that's and a, that that's a very helped high them level. a lot. Yes. I found that was very important. That's nice. So. So over 12 years, um, 144 papers, I had 144, at least 144 state-of-the-art state papers. Of the art, so, yeah. so when I was first told that I would be editor, I contacted one of my mentors, mm -hmm. Mort Boziak, and said, we want to make sure the paper, the, the journal is pertinent for our readers, so we need insight into simple things. So, sure. Mort, I want you to write a paper on renal cysts. Okay. And that became the Bosniak classification of renal cysts. Wow. Became a very famous paper. But he had a whole year to write that paper. And that, that came out as being very successful. Right. Very interesting. So, um, you also had um, um, uh, good colleagues here, like uh, who went along outside, like what your interaction with Zaruni and other people. So what can you say about that? You know, you, you say that um, I didn't get that. You worked when the CT was coming in, and then the MRI came, and then you had uh, Elliot Fishman, Zaruni, and all those things. So how was your interaction? How was how do you see like how how like Zaruni went went ahead and became a nice director and everything. So you are so when it first started out in late nineteen seventy eight. December 1978, we got our first CT scanner. Yes. And it could be used for neuroradiology. Yes. It could be used for body. So we divided the day, and uh, neuroradiology would get it at 1 o'clock. Okay. So we had like from 7.30 to 12.30, we had like five hours, or so maybe five and a half hours, to do our scans. When I was running it, I could do 12. So I would be able to get 12. And I had various residents and fellows who wanted to help, and what I judged was who could, who could do 12. And Zahuni could do 12, so he became a fellow. Eventually, Fishman could do 15. <laughs> <laughs> so yes. he, was, he was really talented at, yes. at getting it. And the thing that I am most known about it. One of the things I'm most known about at Hopkins was that we only had 12 slots. So who gets those 12 slots? So the day before, you could call me at 4 o'clock and plead to get a case put on. And very frequently, I would say, that'd be interesting. But no, we, don't, we can't give that a high enough priority. So I would be turning down these professors for their scan. It wasn't the professors, but it was, yeah. Yeah, it was sure. some of them were their patients. So yeah. for an hour every afternoon, yeah. I made up the schedule for the next day. Wow. And it, w it could be painful, and I was turning down. And then if the machine would go down, oh boy, we'd have a backlog. So sure. getting, the, getting the cases through would seem to be the top thing. So I was very fortunate to have wonderful fellows. Elias Zahuni was my first fellow, then David Nadish then Elliot Fishman, and then Janet Kuhlman was the fourth fellow. Yes. All became uh, professors. Professors and all are quite well known in the field. Right. So, um, uh, uh, what are some of the challenges you have seen through your career here at Hopkins? Well, 
Hopkins has been a wonderful place and I never saw many insurmountable challenges. One was that we had this wonderful residency, everyone wanting to come, everyone turning out all these professors and we would have five residents a year or maybe six. And anesthesia had 25 residents. Sure. So I would always go to the uh, committee in charge and plead to have more residents and they would say, I'm sorry, but the Maryland Health Course Commission restricts our number. If you get another resident, some other program has to drop a resident, we can't. Okay. And you know, when they'd recruit a new chairman, the dean would agree to give them more residents, but at my level, I, I couldn't get more residents. So in a way that was good for the residents we had, they had to work very hard and uh, they, you know, there, weren't, there were many more faculty than residents and the re it was a gem of a residency because of that. So it was a challenge, but I think it worked out all right. So, among all through these years at Hopkins, what are some of the fondest memories you have, like, you know? Well, the fondest memories was, were of that wonderful time when um, we would get, when we were doing CT, we'd get a patient with Wilms tumor, and we'd get these interesting images and a second one, and no one had ever written a paper about yeah. the CT of Wilms tumor. We had a paper, so it was almost like a, Fifth, one, one out of every five patients we were examining were, were going into a paper. And I had a bulletin board, and on that bulletin board I had a list of 10 papers that had to be written, and I had people volunteering for those. Uh, and I remember once I had wanted to have, have a paper on CT of bronchiectasis. Yes. And Dave Nader says, I, I'd like to do that. And I gave him two weeks off to write the paper. No, no one ever does that anymore, you know. Sure. But, and yeah, that paper now has been cited 450 times. Yes. So that, that, was, that was a highlight time, a time when we were seeing things that no one had ever seen before. Yes. Because um, there was an NIH proposal to create a better CT scanner. Mm -hmm. And uh, the proposal was one by Sadek Hillel at Columbia who helped developed uh, this scanner uh -huh. th called the American Science and Engineering Scanner. That was our first scanner. And that was a much better scanner than any other scanner yes. that was available. Most of the other hospitals had scanners that were not as good. So we were really we seeing things that other people weren't seeing. Interesting. Because that makes a lot of difference when you're, uh, yeah. This, then you saw this um, uh, evolutionary leap in the CT also from single slice to helical to multi-detector. Right, I saw the evolution, CT was getting better and better. And what about the MRI? You were involved with MRI? Well, when MRI came, we had um, s some very good people, uh, Elia Sahuni. Yes. And MRI was a little bit beyond me, but I have a son who also was a math major, mm -hmm. and I told him, take Fourier analysis, it's gonna be important. Sure. And now he's the head of MRI at the University of Pennsylvania. He, so he's, he's my um, MRI. And now <laughs> when there was a time when people would meet me, they would say, oh, you're the, you're the Hopkins professor. Oh, you're the editor of radiology. Now when I meet people, they say, oh, you're Evan Siegelman's father. That's, <laughs> and, and that's the best thing the father can. It's very nice. Yeah. Nice to hear. I also know that um, your daughter-in-law is also a radiologist. I worked with her on a number of projects. Right. So, as I mentioned earlier, I have one sibling, a brother. Yes. Who lives in Houston, Texas. Okay. And he had two children, a son and a daughter. And his son came to Maryland and was working at NSA. Mm -hmm. And my mother called me and said, Stan, you've got to find a, a woman for Robert. <laughs> she gave me that assignment. So I waited a year, and then I had this very nice, bright first year resident. Yes. So I went up to her and said, would you mind if, w would you be interested, or would you mind if um, my nephew called you for a date? She said, no, I wouldn't mind. And so I, uh, I oh, arranged the meeting, and so Robert married Jennifer. So you're not only an editor, but you're also a matchmaker. You're also a matchmaker. And uh, uh, Jennifer has done very well, and she has, 
and very nice to work with her because she's one of the people has interacted co quite closely. Um, so, uh, if anything that you want to say about the department, I know you also worked with a number of chairs. Um, so, your interactions with the chair and how right. So, Hopkins has had five chair of radiology and ch chair people, and I have known all of them. When I first got here, mm -hmm. the first chair, the first full-time academic chairman was Russell Morgan. He had become dean. Yes. And he was a very wise man, and people would hang on his words, whatever he'd say. And he said, I remember, he said, in the 1970s, the stock market will never go above 1,000. And he was right. But then came Martin Donner. Unfortunately, he developed a severe cardiomyopathy sure. and passed away. But then, particularly after that, the chairman mm -hmm. uh, became not only an officer of the department, yes. but if he w w or she were recognized by the dean as someone of value and talent, they would be recruited to also work yep. for university. And so the chairman, when they first started the first year or two, they spent a lot of time organizing things and setting it up. And after that, they spent more than half their time away from the department. Yes. But it was good because the institution, the dean came to respect radiology. Yes. And when we made a request for fancy equipment, it was recognized that yeah, this was probably a good investment. So Dr. Brody uh, became vice, vice president of a, of a, mm -hmm. at Minnesota, and then he became president of Johns Hopkins yes. University. Yes. Dr. Zahuni became uh, assistant dean and then head of NIH. Yes. There's one story I like to tell about Dr. Zahuni, mm -hmm. and that is he was, there were two assistant deans, one in charge of clinical and one in charge of research. So does, Dr. Zahuni was a, assistant dean in charge of clinical and supervising the clinical practice. But the researchers were very unhappy. Okay. Several of the leading researchers came to the dean. They said, we are unhappy. We are not getting enough support from the institution. Some of our key young people are threatening to leave. Sure. We've got to do something. So they said, what can I do? They said, we want Zuhuni. Wow. So Zuhuni became for a while, Did assistant dean for research. He called them all in and he said, all right, I want you to make a list of what you want sure. to make things better. And they had several meetings and they came up with lists. And they gave them the top three things on their list and they became happy. This, yeah, that makes, that's the vision of a leadership. So, Elias is just a wonder and I asked his wife, you know, Nadja, by, how did Elias get to be so well informed about all of these things about research and business? And she says, that's just Elias. He's, <laughs> he's just a, a sort of a genius. Yeah, I remember because uh, one year I, I had just come back from Algeria uh, for a conference. I was in ACR and he walks by and he's like, how was Algeria? Mm -hmm. I didn't, because he had a knack for remembering names and people. Right. It was really a talent. And then mm -hmm. Dr. Lewin came along for yes. 10 years. He was very active in the medical school and he has gone on to be yeah, president of Emory. medical affairs at Emory. So, yes. and I'm sure someday mm -hmm. Karen Norton will have her time here, what, sure. be five or six years, but eventually I think she will go on somewhere as a dean or. Yeah, which speaks highly of our, uh, the department you, you all have built. Well, it's a good place to be from. Mm -hmm. And when I first got here, there was Phil Alderson in nuclear medicine. He became chairman sure. at Columbia. There was Everett James in charge of research. He became chairman at Vanderbilt. There were, and there were actually three other people who initially here sure. left become, yeah. to become chairman at other Ex places. Exactly. So the other thing is like, um, what is your, since you have spent so much time in education for the residents, things are changing now because I know you, radiology um, is, is searching itself about how to how to project radiologists in the general public, how because general public does not know who the radiologist sometimes. So how do you see like how should our young radiologists prepare themselves to carry the field future? 
Well, I think it's through their excellence. Okay. When you have an excellent radiologist, he will get a claim from his other clinicians and be promoted that way. So over the years, I did all this teaching and got accolades from mm -hmm. some of my residents. So what was it that I was doing? Yeah. Was it because I was teaching him specific things? No. It was, one of my principles was be a physician, not just a film reader. Okay. And getting the residents not only to recognize the radiologic manifestation of disease, but to understand the disease, the natural history, the complications, so they knew what to look for. Understand. The other thing was to find joy in the work. Show, get, show a cases that you get excited about. Yes. Show eureka moments where you found something very significant. And that's one of the, th one of the things I espouse the advice to the resident. Go f to the resident. Go for the joy. Yes. Find something in life that brings you joy. Too often, people are oriented toward the finances, but sure. the, the personal happiness is much more important than the finances. So basically, the finance will take care of itself. The finances will take it, will certainly more than take care of itself. So. That's, that's correct. But you find like that you have to find yourself a joy in this one. In fact, right now, the, the Dean Rothman is, uh, Dean Rothman is having a project called Joy in Medicine to bring back joy in medicine with the same intention to avoid any of these physician burnout and discouragement, everything. So it's yeah. kind of nice to know that that's what it sustained you for all these years. Yeah. And I, I tell my colleagues that um, whenever I see you teach the residents, I can't complain coming to teach the resident at 7.30 because you're already there, <laughs> and uh, which is really very fond of that one. Any other things which you want to sh share with us? Well, well let, me, uh, let me tell a story about my early days. So I trained in this program with Harold Jacobson. Yes. And he liked quizzing. So every conference, someone would show a case and a resident would get quizzed. And once a week, there was a resident in charge of quizzing called the Regiment of Pathology who would quiz the faculty. Yes. <laughs> and he loved to see interesting cases. And if the cases weren't interesting, uh -huh. He would, get after, he would get after the resident on, on pathology. So the resident would make a deal with two or three other institutions to switch cases. So he always had interesting cases. So if there was uh, a classic radiologic appearance of an entity, I would have seen it two or three times. So I was really good at being quizzed. So when I went to the boards at the time, when I took the boards in radiology, and I took the boards in San Francisco. Okay, not in Ken uh, Louisville, Kentucky. Yeah. You know, so all the examiners were mainly program directors, okay. professors, and they would bring their own cases. Yeah. And they'd have their cases that they thought were fair to test. And if they got someone really good, they had these extra cases. So <laughs> I was I f went through the chest cases easy, and then this this Mel Figley put up this case and. It was anomalous pulmonary venous drainage below the diaphragm, and I got it. He was the base that I got. And also, I got the case in musculoskeletal. So these two people wrote Dr. Jacobson a letter congratulating him wow. on training a resident. After that, I was, that really made me. I was golden. Sure. So Dr. Jacobson was invited to a course at the University of Minnesota. That was the first postgraduate course. He invited me to come with him. And then he would give a course at the Rentgen Ray. He invited me to come with him. And even a, I continued that after I came to Hopkins. For 20 consecutive years, I gave a course on musculoskeletal radiology at the Rentgen Ray. And then I was elected to the board. I became chairman of the board. I would have become president uh, of the AJR, but I became editor of radiology, so I had to resign. Yes, I, I see that because otherwise, I know you're heavily in, involved with the professional societies, but with editorship, you took a lot. So in New York City, we had clubs mm -hmm. that would meet at Mount Sinai Hospital at night once a month. There was a bone club. Yeah. There was a cardiovascular club. So those clubs met with clubs from other cities and evolved into, the bone club evolved into the Society of Musculoskeletal Radiology. I was a founding member of that. 
the, the cardiovascular club evolved into the Society of Cardiovascular Radiology. I was a finding, founding member of that too. So the, the other question is like, I know you were heavily involved with research, with uh, academic, how did you also balance your work life? That's the big thing now, so I just wanted to ask you. Balance my work life, well, I guess put, put the main focus on the things that gave me the most joy. Sure. And if there was something I felt less enthralled with or less competent with, find a really competent person and give them the responsibility for doing it. So the talent of searching the right to delegate to the right person. Right. It's, 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 that's a very difficult one. And part of my success in the residency was giving responsibility to residents when I thought they deserved it. Okay. Interesting. So um, for the youngsters now entering the field, like if you were to do all over again, would you have chosen radiology? I think so. Okay. But uh, the thing is that when I, one of the reasons I had difficulty making up mind what to go into is that I liked everything. Yes. First I thought I was gonna go into psychiatry, <laughs> then medicine, cardiology. I mean, I had thoughts of going to neurology or orthopedic surgery. Well, not, not general surgery, so I was gonna go into urology and work the artificial kidney. I had all these thoughts. I loved everything. Yeah. And I think um, when I went to the Fort Meade Army Hospital, the director was a urologist. And he said, as a young guy, he came to his first military base and they said, we need a urologist. You are going to be the urologist. <laughs> and I felt if I had been given an assignment to go into some other specialty, would I would have been happy because it's the learning and the in-depth learning and being able to help people in a certain area that, that... In a way, radiology was lucky to have you. But I, th I think I could have been happy in other specialties. Yeah. And I continued to think of myself as a physician yes. to be aware of what was going on in other areas, uh, particularly as they pertain to radiology. So basically, like the holds, wholesomeness of the patient makes a difference in a good radiologist you know, to bring them in an even higher talent. Right. Okay. So finally, like before we close, I just want to, what would you li most likely to be remembered for? Well, I guess that uh, to be remembered for that, I came to Johns Hopkins and uh, vitalized the program in radiology, helped develop a number of individuals who've made an important contribution to the field. And in fact, uh, because of your contribution, the re residency training program is highly recognized nationally as, uh, every year, by year by year. And also, I think, improved the Journal of Radiology yes. in terms of making it better for the authors and the reviewers particularly, and the readers. With all these years of experience, uh, uh, what would you advise in, uh, some, somebody fresh out of medical school, thinking about radiology, what would you advise? Go for the joy, that's, yeah. that's my advice. Find, a, find the best program that you can get into and really apply yourself for several years so that you, that you finally get it. And to sustain through that, continue the joy and keep the inter interest. Yes. Dr. Siegelman, it was a pleasure for having this chance to have a talk with you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.